Now, we don't usually do a his and hers presentation because each of us likes to have the last word. <laughs> but if you've got questions, ask me at the end of his talk. Okay? So my talk is the first half of this presentation, and David will follow. And as Rob mentioned, what we're going to do is consider the treasures that we have in the firehouse and the stories behind them. Now, everyone loves a story. Once upon a time, as a child, right? They like to tell stories. The big fish I caught out in the bay. Didn't bring it home, but it was very big. <laughs> and some people like to make up stories. The make up stories are people like my daughter Eleanor, who's in the back, whose stories come out of her head. She says that they're fiction and have nothing to do with the family members. My stories tonight are about actual objects that we've found the history of. The first, to first topic is going to be the forgotten popes in the firehouse. The picture that I'm showing is the carved wood emblem of the Vatican. This has nothing to do with the popes in the firehouse. When Betsy Horvitz and Sue Harris were picking up things in the firehouse, helping us rearrange, they put up this lovely painting, which our friend from New Zealand did, Spike Wademan, based on one of the glass slide negatives that was developed and then put into a print, which you can see below the picture, below the painting. We think, and Sarah Hackett, I think I saw come in. Is she here? Yes. OK, Sarah always connect, corrects me on the spelling. We think it's Rosmond. Is that right? Bouvet, we think, who's the painter. We can't prove it, but we think that is one of our, our Anasquam artists and a relation to Sarah. When you come into the firehouse, you see this lovely picture, but we had to take things down to get that picture up. And to tell you the truth, the things that we took down, I thought, thought were real birds. They were so covered in ma, you know, sort of cobwebs, dirt, and dust, I thought it was feathers. And when we took them down, we realized, no, they're actually carved wood. And this is a quail, and the other object is a pigeon. Unfortunately, each is missing a leg. They are hung up by one leg, and you can see that in the, in the picture. They are also bolted to the panel from behind, so they're not going to fall off if the string breaks. They're beautifully carved. And I had never seen anything like this before, so I looked on the internet for carved wood birds. And we found this gentleman named Alexander Pope Jr. Has everybody got it now? Pope. OK. He worked in his family's lumber yard. He studied art. Actually, he studied anatomy with William Rimmer in Boston. He made carvings of game, actually in a relatively small period of time, four years. Two are owned by Tsar Alexander III, or were owned. We have two, we think. And the other interesting thing is that Alexander Pope Jr. was noted for his trompe l'oeil paintings. The only photograph that I could find on the net at the time was this bird, which looks very similar, I think you'll agree, to our pigeon. And this was auctioned off at Skinner in 2016. And I've blown up his signature in the bottom because one of the items that was noted was, you have to be careful, there are a lot of knockoffs. There are a lot of people who have made things very, in very similar fashion. This is just to show you what this man could do. In the Boston Sunday Post, if a person wishes to be startled out of his ordinary complacency and to almost believe the days of sorcery have returned, it's a little different than most pros now, he has but to visit Alexander Pope's studio in this city and to look at a recent painting titled The Wild Swan. This looks like a carving. At first, when I saw the image, I thought it was a carving, but it's trompe l'oeil. On the back, 
when we figured out that you don't just look at the front of an object, you look at the back, we found this sticker with tape, and at the very top, it has the word Sumner Andrew. Does that ring any bells? Anasquam, Massachusetts. In the middle, it says Agent and Highland Avenue. And then there's this very difficult to read writing, but it looks like it's Alec Pope, painted and car carved and painted by Alec Pope. But we had to find the signature to prove that. And originally, I had not seen that signature. Now, that's a shameful, shameful thing for me, who's a radiologist and is supposed to see things like that. But I went back and changed the lighting a little bit and did some stuff with a camera. And I think you can appreciate that on each of those panels, there's A. Pope Jr. So we have two very interesting historic carvings that nobody really appreciated for years that have been hanging on the wall, dusty, and cover it, covered with um, cobwebs. Now, if you turn around, you're still at the front door in the firehouse. And if you turn around and look on the other side, the first thing that you see, if you're typical, is the red ball, right? The red attracts everybody's attention. There are some wonderful drawings here. There's some lithographs. But the other thing that's here is a very small photograph. And Mr. Hansen has one in his hand that he brought up. There we go, that he brought up because he was interested in the history of this photograph. I was too, because when I saw it first, and I only was taking it down to clean it, this was when the cleanup was going on earlier this spring, can you identify anything about this photograph? Please call Patsy, 28302, uh, better not privacy, right? However, it must have been an old card, because 978 isn't on there. And everybody in this audience probably knows this is Patsy Whitlock. What did we just learn from the last item? Look at the back. So we looked at the back of the painting, of the photograph, rather, because it's obvious that, Fred, uh, that FDR is sitting right middle of the photograph. Can you see him? So you have to look at the back of the card to find out that this is actually about the sailor president. I've taken this off of YouTube because the boat, it is a boat, isn't it? That's a boat. That's a boat. <laughs> I have such trouble with boats. And a submarine is a boat. 10,000 10, ton is also a boat. A boat, right. That's a boat. That's a boat. So on YouTube, you can actually look up this boat, which is called the Amberjack, and there is some video from the 30s of FDR sailing in this boat. The card has this very difficult writing because it's faded with the light. The ink has just faded away, except for the very bottom, which actually was hidden underneath the, the frame. So the light was transmitted through the glass to that ink to fade it. And this is a problem throughout the firehouse. A lot of documents have faded over time, especially those that were written with ink. We played some games with Photoshop, changed the contrast a little bit, and this is the transcript. On his way down to Maine, Campobello, son Elliot, upper left, President Franklin D. Roosevelt about 1934. Now I've written, that's the card. It turns out that this was actually 1933. On his yacht came down the Anasquam River from Gloucester, where he was presented with the painting of the Gertrude L. Thibault schooner in the Fisherman's Race with Canada. So he came down the Anasquam River from Gloucester. He got the painting in Gloucester. Captain Ben Pine, the bald head next left of president, was skipper. He, it means the president, was anchored off the Anasquam Yacht Club for lunch. He didn't get out of the boat. Remember, he's paralyzed at this point, partially paralyzed. Many people came to club floats and in small boats to wave to Prez. And in ink at the bottom, Carol, in parentheses, I was 12 at the time. 
R.C. Davis, my dad, took us out in Zeehunt, his boat. And who's Carol? Carol and Davis Purse. So we, we made sure that that was the right signature, her age fit for 1933, and this was the story. Now, the story didn't end quite there. I won't read all of this out, but you may know that General Benjamin Franklin Butler lived in Bayview. So those on Nashua Avenue in Anasquam are abutting the Ames estate, which Butler was associated with. And what happened was one of the great-grandsons of the general was asked by the President Ames, will you take us through? And the crew mem young crew member, he was a roommate of one of Roosevelt's sons, through what? Through the canal. Well, he said, well, I've done it. But he was a bit nervous about this, and he didn't want to do it, really. Roosevelt handed him the tiller, she's yours. Now, the reason that this happened was he was trying to give the slip to the escorting vessels. They were too big to go through the canal. They had to go around Cape Ann. So this was done purely to get rid of his escort. And he had a grand time doing it, of course. And that's how Anasquam Yacht Club got to have the president sail right by. Now, Jimmy Groves, who's in the audience here, I asked him about this. And Jim knows a lot about the local history. And this is a wonderful story, more story on story. Regarding FDR and the Depression years, Paul Littlefield, and Jackie's here, repeatedly told a story of FDR cruising up the Anasquam in a schooner, the only president to do so. And when the schooner reached the AYC, Paul and the others fired a 21-gun salute for the president. And Jimmy says, I know David will be dismayed in hearing this, but rounds expended consisted of a quick bang, bang of two, a pause, and then a one. So the parsimonious AYC members were extremely proud that they gave the president a 21-gun salute with only three rounds expended. <laughs> so how did this story occur? How did this story come about? We had the photograph. We also had the card, the, a little bit of information. And that's what's desperately needed for much of the, many of the items, much of the treasures in the, in the uh, firehouse. We used Photoshop, modern techniques to get the transcription. Internet, absolutely golden. We can't do any of this research, really, without looking up all of these references easily. And I might mention that now we have, from the firehouse, we have a few of our documents and books on the internet. One of them is archive.org. And anytime you come to the firehouse, we can introduce you to how to get onto these websites. But I wanted to make sure that you knew that ladies in the firehouse, volunteers, were very good about snipping out bits of newspaper clippings. And they actually had the whole story in a scrapbook, which was in the firehouse and which we've managed to get digitized on archive.org. So it's available to all. And I think you can see a picture of the president in the corner and a lot, of, a lot of talk about him. Who was the painter, the artist? Mr. Groupie. Well, there's the painting. Now, it was said to have been hung in Roosevelt's office but nobody remembers what's happened to it. What Gruppe did was in the 60s, he made a copy because that was the original was lost. And I just wanted to show you that he painted the schooner as he remembered having done it for the president. So all of this with genealogical resources in terms of the Butler family, the Ames family, local knowledge, unless we'd had local information coming in from those ladies who got those newspaper clippings, we would have had no story. So this is the story of the sailor president in Anasquam. My last, uh, am I okay for time? I'm trying, I can't, if I go over time, I'm not gonna be happy person <laughs> because I'm not gonna live with a happy person. Yeah. So my last item is a lane and a story. 
Originally, when I put the program together, I, I was going to talk about the artistic captain on River Road. Don't worry, you are going to hear about the artistic captain, probably in the artistic. fall. Pardon? It's artistic. Artistic, yeah, art, not, yeah, not autistic, artistic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is. <laughs> and that story has turned into a saga. We actually now have chapters for that artistic captain, and we're waiting for some of them to be to coming in. So you will hear that. This is an even more interesting story for the moment because it connects two items that are important right now. It's why we need archival space for Anasquam's treasures. This is what happened in 2015 or 16. A photograph was taken. And you can see it's along the, or if you haven't been in the firehouse, this is on the top floor. And on that middle table, there is some fabric. And it's folded up, and it happens to be a quilt. Well, when the group was putting together the exhibition that is now currently being held in the firehouse on the Anasquam Village Church, they were looking for the signature quilt that was supposed to have been a fundraiser for the church. And they said it was in the firehouse. Well, most signature quilts that I remembered are usually squares. And this was said to be a red signature quilt. So again, I lost my radiology licensure on this one. Because when we went upstairs, Holly and I saw this originally, but it was a brown triangular quilt with no signatures. But I think, as you can see from the picture, it's half red, half brown. And the part that we were looking at was brown. And it's brown because of the sunlight. So that has changed the dyes. And this particular part of the quilt had no signatures on it. So what you have to do, you have to take the whole quilt apart. So I was worried about this and thinking, that's the only thing we've seen that looks like a quilt. I'm going to go back took the whole thing out, and sure enough, it is a signature quilt. And that's what the good blocks look like that have not been exposed to the light. You see the red and the white? This one has a single signature in one block. I wanted to show you because nobody shows you the back of things. And I've been emphasizing you have to look at an object from all angles. This is the back of the quilt. And I think it was made of shirting fabric, bits and pieces of leftover, along with some pink, very coarse weave cotton. Notice this is a quilt that's been tied. You see the little bits of, of thread. Uh, it's not a quilted, uh, hand quilted all the way through quilt, but it is hand pieced. And if you look at the quilt in, in detail, you find that it's made, see this middle right here? made by Mrs. Judith Lane, 89 years old. Now, Mrs. Judith Lane, what happens with women often when they're widowed, they can get their own name back. You may appreciate that I'm a bit of a feminist about this. The fact that my first cards were Mrs. David Teal has nothing to do with that feeling. Anyway, so made by Mrs. Judith... <laughs> but what we did, what did we do? We went to genealogic sources on the internet, and we found Judith Lane, and I'm going to read, point this out to you, I think, because it might be hard to see. The writing can be very tough. There are misspellings by the census taker, so when you're looking at these records, be very careful, especially when there are complicated names. But Judith Lane lived at 17 Chester Square with Harriet, her daughter, and Orville, her son. Orville was a mariner, and the daughter was listed as doing nothing. <laughs> this is in 1900. 1900. So we could figure out that when, she, that when she made the quilt, and when the quilt finally got used, she, the quilt was probably about 1905. Now, when we said that she stitched it, it was hand-stitched. There were sewing machines available at that time. 
but we took a close-up of one of the seams that is partly undone. And I think you can see the in and out of somebody who's hand sewn all of these pieces together. Talk about a labor of love, and it's beautifully done. Then tied. So what do we do? Now we say, she's died in Anasquam. We found her death certificate. We went up to Mount Adna to look for the lanes. And luckily, I've got Eleanor who can find these gravestones. The Lane gravestone, Frederick Lane. His wife is Judith Story Lane. Title, a lane with a story. Now, even further, that she is actually a real daughter of the American Revolution. Her father fought in the American Revolution as a teenager. So if you go up to her gravestone, you will see the symbol of the DAR. Now, I'm British by birth. I had no idea what the DAR was. Daughters of the American Revolution. But they're, it's interesting that their symbol is actually a flax around the distaff, as well as a spinning wheel. So it fits right in with her background as a sewer in, in this way, granted not a spinner. But I thought it was lovely that the symbol actually reflected her interests. So then we found a report of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And we had Mrs. Judith Story Lane and Mrs. Martha Story Denison Lane. I thought, this is crazy. What's this about? Well, there are a lot of lanes. Her sister married a different lane. So again, I find, you know, I'm learning about the numbers of different families in this region who all have the same surname. She's actually also Anasquam royalty. Here's Judith's story, circled at the bottom. Okay, she's the daughter of James Story, who fought in the Revolutionary War. And we'll go backwards into her genealogy. And she is a descendant of Abraham Robinson and of Mary Harrandane, which is Harridan. So the Harridan's name got changed in spelling all the way through the last few hundred years. Abraham Robinson, does this ring any bells? Yes, it's the plaque that's down here on River Road. This, unfortunately, is in rather a bad state right now. Mary Robinson was a Harridan, and that tells about this changes in names, Harridane and Harrenden, and all of the descendants. But the planter's neck, obviously, is important. And I'll show you a better picture when it was done about 30 years ago. The company from Plymouth under Abraham Robinson. So she's a descendant of that early settler to Anasquam and Planter's Neck. So Judith Story Lane, who left her story in a quilt, as opposed to history, I thought was a very good way to introduce the fact that this community has been ongoing in its support of people, the church, the buildings, the community in general for many years. And this is a segue and an advertisement because in 1939, these are the ladies at the sewing table at the Anasquam Fair, Sea Fair, which is in a couple of weeks. And Christine, who's in the audience, sent us this nice paper. And one of the things that was written on that was preservation is the business of saving communities and the values they embody. It's not just about saving things. Things, if you can get at it, things have great stories. There's an old maxim in audiovisual presentation, which is to tell your audience what you're going to tell them. You tell them, and at the end, you tell them what you told them. <laughs> and so what I'm going to tell you is a little bit about our extraordinary collection of photographs, which we can mesh with the data that we have in the files and the scrapbooks, the data from the internet, the incredible job that Betsy Horowitz has done is taking, of taking all the data off the photographic jackets, the backs of prints, 
and put them all together so that when I walk down Leonard Street in July 1900 and I meet a guy, I know that that is William Davis, who lives in Rob Russell's house, and he's an old guy, but he used to be a sea captain. And I know his brother, Gideon Lane Davis, because we have the most extraordinary photograph of Gideon L. Davis, and I know where he lives. It comes alive. So if you take all of the material that's in the firehouse, our most important things are the mix, the photographs, paper files, manuscripts, scrapbooks. We have <clears throat> Oliver Lane, a famous sea captain's underwear among the fabric items. I'm not sure it's our most important item, but it's among the most interesting items. We also have Oliver Lane's sea desk upstairs. That is considerably more interesting. And of course, we have the stagecoach. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the photography, and then I'm going to segue gracefully, I hope, to the stagecoach, and I'm going to hammer on you what I believe is to be a crying need to fix our lack of archival space and proper places to put things. So there, I've told you what I'm going to tell you. Our photographs range to back to the beginning of photography. Can you hear me in the back? Go back to the beginning of photography with some daguerreotypes. Somehow, they have managed to survive in an unhe unheated, unair conditioned, unending building, sometimes in a state of what I would describe as parlous. They need to go into archival space. We know a lot about many of the images, but it's still an ongoing process, and we constantly are finding more information. Right now, we have something like 3,000 images or more. And taken together with our, with our records and with what we can find from the internet, they make a portrait of this village 125 years ago, which I have chosen to call a portrait of a place in time. Not a portrait of a place and time. It's a portrait of where the village of Anasquam was 120, 130 years ago. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a very abbreviated small selection of some of our photographs to give you an idea of the breadth and depth of what we have. I can't show you 3,000 photographs or we'd have the EMTs here resuscitating the audience. We have a lot of pictures that look like this. They are panoramic photographs of the village at differing times going back to perhaps 1870. This one, I believe, is probably around 1920 by the combination of the film, the photographic range dynamics, and the boats in the harbor, and the houses. We have a lot of this. So if you have a house, if you have a friend's house, we can find it from almost any angle. And Rita asked me to point out that the thing that looks like a thumb up on the right horizon above what is now Annie Meyer's house is Squam Rock before the trees grew up, sticking up like the north face of the Eiger. And we had someone do a painting of our backyard, and he put the rocks up there. And people came and said, well, there's nothing up there like that but we've forgotten because of all the trees. We also have 700 or so, is that about right, Betsy, for Martha Harvey? Roughly 700 of Martha Harvey's paintings, many of which are concentrated in the Gloucester fishing industry, although there are, there are ones in Anasquam as well. And Martha Harvey, in addition to being a pioneering woman photographer, was a hell of a good photographer. This is just a random sample. We have photographs of marauding bands of artists who descended on the village right about June and disappeared at the end of September, some of whom were actually very good and moderately famous for the period. We know every single character in this picture right down to the name of the joker sitting in the back as a model of the schooner. We have 
right underneath your feet, right back here. John Davis's provision store running out of the village hall with a dining room. And the question is, I think the guy with the cleaver looks like he just got out of the Bates Motel. When you, when you blow up the imagery, he's kind of pop-eyed, and he's got this bloody cleaver in his hand. We have commercial sale. We have a schooner named the Dyer frozen into the harbor. Can anybody tell me where that is in the harbor? The house, yeah, the boat livery is right good. The boat livery is right behind the schooner, and that enormous structure was a collapsing coal dock. Because the schooners came in, they delivered coal to that coal dock or that coal pocket out there, and there was another one just on the other side of the bridge in the Spencer's backyard. So we had at least two coal pockets or coal docks. And then we have the summer folk. Anasquam has had dog boats. There have been Anasquam cat boats, Anasquam bird boats. And these are Anasquam bird boats here, a whole flock. <laughs> and fish boats. And it goes on and on. And we have boats from much earlier in the history of yachting. And Martha Harvey took a lot of good ones. And then we have the people that lived here. A picture of a house, eh, it's interesting, it's an old house. A picture of a house like Rob's, where you know who built it, and is more interesting. But if you can populate the village, if you can populate what you have with the people, these are kids, normal, year-round kids, living in Anasquam. Like I'm trying to figure exactly how to describe them, because they're not urchins. They're the, they're the daughters of children of the people that lived in the village. And my wife looked at this and said, can you imagine trying to keep all that clothes clean in 1895? And I said, I don't know. I just throw it in the washing machine. <laughs> but we also have, we have the children of the Leonard School posed on the front step of the schoolhouse. And I got to the point where I start to be able to recognize the children. And the little girl in the middle, in the second row, looking straight at the camera, is Sarah Hackett's, ready, Sarah? That's Sarah Hackett's mother, Ida. And she is a thread that runs through a lot of these pictures. But there are others. We have, we have a Davis daughter of the lighthouse keeper. And you can recognize her. And I think if people put their minds to it, they'll be able to attach names to many of these. And then we have, way up the hill, we have the children of the well-to-do. And this is James Hall, who was a prosperous cracker manufacturer who bought and developed, I call him a, the subdivision of Cambridge Avenue. So the man in the middle, distinguished looking gent with the gray hair, is James Hall, the creator of the Cambridge Avenue subdivision. And his children aren't, are dressed much better than the children in the previous photographs. I don't know whether he had nine children or whether the woman on the far left might have been a nanny. We're never going to figure it out. And then we have charming photographs. We don't know who they are. And then we have the gentry in the gig about to go from James Mellon's house on Cambridge Avenue to catch the 6.30 train to Boston so they could get into their offices. And I'll bet you in 1895, they got to Boston just about as fast <laughs> as you would do if you left tomorrow morning or Monday morning. And this is the other half of the uh, Cambridge Avenue was a soap manufacturer it was known as Soap and Cracker Avenue to some people. <laughs> and the, guy, the dude here in the solar toupee on the right is a soap manufacturer from Cambridge coming down the hill with his imported wife. I think she's English, but she might be French. I have to look back. She has the most spectacular dress on. If you get the close-up pictures, every one of those cherries or whatever they are is embroidered perfectly. And then, of course, we got normal people. This is Uncle Jake Tucker, 
resting in the shade. That's is that what I said, Betsy? Yeah, he's got a very bad case of hat hair. <laughs> and we go over to Arlington Street and we go to the Chamberlain Lodge. Is that right? Right? On the second deck overlooking Arlington Street. I think the woman's dress, second woman from the right's dress must have cost more than most of the houses in Anisquam. And look at the dude lying on the ground on the oriental rug. <laughs> so this is one side of the coin, and here's the other coin side. We have people that worked in the hotels, the boarding houses. We don't know who she is, but I bet she made a good pie. And then we have, sometimes we have people who aren't completely, absolutely thrilled with their lot in life. But what do all these people have in common, aside from being an Anasquam? They have in common that if they wanted to go from Anasquam to the depot to catch a train, or if they wanted to go from Anasquam to go shopping in Gloucester, or if they wanted to catch a stagecoach to go to Salem, they took one of our two competing stagecoach lines. Anisquam was so prosperous that it had two different stagecoach lines, at least one of them with multiple stagecoaches. And this is virtu with virtual certainty, our stagecoach parked in front of 109 Main Street. And if you notice, every single person in the coach climbed out for the photographer, and all of the weight is on the top. <laughs> and these things tipped over with some, some ease especially when you put that many people on top. So this is, this is our coach on Main Street in Gloucester, probably about 1890. And this is our coach today. And for those of you who haven't been in the firehouse recently, there's a little less junk in the foreground, but the coach is still wedged into the back of the room with the top of its head up against the ceiling. The top of the coach should have a seats and luggage rack, you can't even put them on. You can't walk behind the coach. It is not in the right place. So what do we actually have? Some of you heard me tell this before, and I'll tell you again briefly. Thanks to Steve Harris, we had two experts appear from the North Woods, from the Abbott and Downing Historical Society, who came into our firehouse. They came in so fast that I couldn't even get the key out of the lock. And they, they had never heard of this coach before. They went over to the coach, <laughs> flung open the door without so much as a buy or leave, and pulled out the jump seat. There's three seats in front, three seats in back, and a jump seat in the middle. And in order to get people into the coach, you can lift the jump seat up. They lift it up, turn it over, and what's on the bottom of the jump seat? It is the serial number of the coach. And this is Roman numeral 54, L1111, which makes it probably somewhere between 1845 and 1850. The, the records of the company that made the world famous Concord coaches have been destroyed by fire. We'll probably never know exactly when it was built. However, the train got to Gloucester in 1847. So all of a sudden, there would have been a need for far more transport to and from. So I like to think they probably bought the coach to match the new demand, but I can't prove it. The question is, who bought it? And the answer is, we know, thanks to the record. Before I go, this is a rare beast, and we have a duty of care to take care of it. And I will go on beyond that. The coach has been through many hands. The lower part of uh, Leonard Street going down towards Chester Square, Back then, it was, might as well have been Chardsville. Every house was lived in by a chard. The chards had the post office. The chards had the store. The chards had the wharf. The chards had the stagecoach line. So it looks as though two brothers, Ezekiel and William Chard, bought this coach. They were certainly the first person to run this coach and this coaching business. They sold out to a guy named James Cunningham. I'll tell you in a second. How are we doing on time? Anybody know? Uh, in 1856, and James A. Cunningham, when the Civil War broke out, sold the coaching business and joined, volunteered for the Union Army. It then went to the Pierces, 
and finally to the Griffin family. And those of you who remember Gert Griffin was a descendant of, of the Griffin family. So Oren and his son James were the last people to run the coach. And guess what we found in our photographic collection? <laughs> Yeah, here's Ezekiel, aged 81, which makes him 1891 for this photograph. And my guess, he didn't have any teeth, looking at the way he's keeping his mouth shut. And he could remember to do up his fly for the photographer, but he, he didn't actually. But we know what Ezekiel looked like. That's what I meant. We can dig through this. If we hadn't done this, we found a print that said Ezekiel chart. Who the hell is Ezekiel chart? But by putting them together and to at the risk of breaking your patience, by going back to the census, we can find the charts down on lower Leonard Street and what houses they were in, who they were living with, and make this old Gomer, who's probably not a lot older than I am, come alive. Who was, you might reasonably ask, the next person to own the coach? His name was James Adams Cunningham. When I looked at that, I thought, there are almost as many Cunninghams around here as there are Davises. It must be something related to local Cunningham. So I asked a couple of local Cunninghams and got a blank. <coughs> but I don't know. And they're right. General James Cunningham was born in Boston. He was an out-of-towner. But he was no dope because he met and married the daughter of Captain Oliver Lane famous sea captain on Arlington Street, the sister of Aunt Tot, and she was that's married into a successful family, and he was no dope himself. He joined the Massachusetts 32nd Regiment of Volunteers. They first went to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. I didn't put it down, but the Massachusetts 32nd was in every famous and devastating Civil War battle in the eastern part of the country that you can possibly name. Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, you name it, the Massachusetts 32nd was there. <clears throat> when Grant, sorry, when Lee finally decided it was time to give up, he sent out officers with a white flag from the, from the Confederate lines to arrange a parley to discuss a meeting place with Grant. And the, either he just happened to be a, dispens, a disposable brigadier general, hey you, or, as a mark of respect, they sent James Cunningham out to meet the Confederate messenger to bring him back so that they could arrange the meeting with Lee and Grant. When he came back from the war, he became the adjutant general of Massachusetts, and they made him superintendent of the old soldier's home in Chelsea. His wife was the matron, and guess what? We have her recipe book. So if you want to know what... General Adams, Adam James Cunningham's wife made her brownies. We've got a recipe book right there. So I not, don't know much about the Pierce ownership, but it ended up in the, in the Griffin family. And Oren was born in 1832. He lived 56 River Road where Gert Griffin ended up living. The stage headquarters was down in the yellow house that Mimi... Davis, thank you, lives in. That was torn down, oh, actually removed. That The barn and everything else was moved up, turned into a home. The little ticket office from the stagecoach went down and became the hairdressing building down on River Road. That was Oren's never throw anything away department. And guess, what does Oren look like? Well, there he is. He's the first old geezer on the left. And I think in this picture he's younger than I am. And there sitting out on the bench in front of number 44 Leonard Street. I'm sorry? Sorry, I, sorry, I can't. Store. Yeah, Sergeant Lane. But this time, at this time it was the sergeant store. And the, so Orrin is on the left. The old geezer looks like he's straight out of a pub from an English crime mystery. It was a retired shipwright who lived down here below where your house is going. 
The guy in the, jet, the dapper gent in the middle, Jonathan Dennison, the blacksmith who lived at Chester Square, and if he wasn't a Civil War vet, I'm Hieronymus Bosch. They all look like that. And Sarah, the guy in the second from the right, Gampy Sargent, who ran the store, and the guy on his right is Chester Parsons, the clerk. It's astonishing what you can figure out. What killed the stagecoach? The advent of the electric trams on the other side of the cove. All of a sudden, the stagecoach became obsolete. It was put out to pasture. And there was a guy named Day, and I don't know whether he was a Day in Anasquam or the Day over in, uh, on the other side, down by the grist mill, uh, the other grist mill, Riverdale. But a farmer bought the coach to keep it from deteriorating. It kept in one of his barns, which is a far-sighted thing to do, because back then stagecoaches were like buying an old F-150 pickup truck with rust. So he bought the stagecoach, and then the Squam double play combo <laughs> swung into action from Griffin to Day, and then to Louis Bell Pusselfer and his sordid friends, including Ann Meyer's grandfather, Charles Fr Frederick Bradley, and the Anasquam Association bought the coach, put it in the barn behind this building, where it stayed until the city of Gloucester ceded the firehouse to the Anasquam Association in the 1950s. And I'll just tell you, if we stop using the firehouse for the purpose that we're using it for, it reverts to the city. So we can't stop having an historical society or we'll lose the building. <laughs> Professor Bradley was very interested in the Anasquam, the village hall. He and friends were were instrumental in rescuing this building from decrepitude. They put and financed the addition over here with a staircase, kept it from falling apart, and made it into the village hall. He was president of the Anasquam Village Hall for this. Ready, Steve? 30 years. <laughs> so you, you haven't even got started yet. <laughs> and he was a pretty good artist. This is his pen and ink drawing of the coach waiting for the mail in front of the village hall when we had the post office here and we still had elm trees. In 1923, in their wisdom, Anasquam as a village decided the best thing they could contribute to Gloucester's 300th anniversary was a stagecoach. And here it is, and we know every single person on the coach, James Griffin is tipping over in the left in the box. In 1973, it came out again. And there is Gert Griffin on the left. And as far as we know, did I do something wrong? As far as I know, it's the last time the coach has been out of the building. My goal, our goal, I'm proposing to you, is that we get this coach ready to be displayed for Gloucester's 400th anniversary in 2023, having been 1923, 1973, and 23. What do we need to do to do that? We need a proper space for the coach. We need proper space for the materials we've talked about. And this is what I'm proposing to you, that we build a new small building somewhere near the existing firehouse. And thanks to our friend, the New Zealand artist, we have a cutaway drawing of a proposed building. And I'm happy at the end of this to go into great detail with anybody who has the slightest interest. But the building's dimensions were set by the stagecoach to give you four feet in front, four feet in back, four feet on each side so a person in a wheelchair can get around it. The smallest legal handicapped toilet we could squeeze in and the rest of the building for a climate-controlled archival space. And the question is, can we do it? We raise the money, and where would we put it? And a more important question is what it looked like. So I played around with Photoshop a little bit, and thanks to my being able to get the Google camera car to come back down Leonard Street, wait for this, in July 2019, I can show you what it looked like. It would look like the firehouse had a puppy, and that is one place where you might put the building. 
there are several places in the campus where you could put the building. And you could point it in different directions. You could have the barn doors open towards this side, which I would prefer. You could have it open towards Walnut Street. And uh, there are there other locations? But it's not an expensive building. It's like building a mini house with a living room, one bedroom, and a toilet. <laughs> Modern construction, which does not costly and is quick and easy to build, as opposed to breaking into the firehouse and trying to add on an addition where you run into all kinds of problems, including triggering handicapped access and all kinds of other things will push the cost right through the roof. So I'm getting the high sign for our Rob to pause here. I'm going to pause here. I will stay. If anybody is still interested, I'm pleased to answer questions. Rita can come up. She'll be pleased to answer questions. I do have this sort of thing where you could look at where it might fit. But I'm also at number 39 Leonard Street. I'd be happy to talk to anybody at more or less any time while I'm awake about the possibilities for this and the permutations, because I've dreamt this up more or less out of my head, and there may very well be better designs than I came up with. And I'm open to, and there's no pride of authorship. I'm open to any kind of suggestions, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.